Okay, uh, Facebook. Uh, so I'm a production engineer. I work on the containers team uh, at Facebook. Uh, the larger name of the team that I work on is called Tupperware. That's the name of the service that we run internally. Um, this is our little logo for that. Uh, obviously, it's a container system. A little bit of details about this thing. Um, it's a custom-built system. Started around 2011. This was long before Docker was a thing. Um, right. Uh, you know, back when uh, uh, people were having to build all their own stuff internally. Um, it's pretty big. Uh, it runs pretty much all of Facebook. Um, it runs on just about all, all the infrastructure. Uh, it runs millions of containers. We have millions of containers created and destroyed daily, uh, up and down. Uh, we've created and destroyed billions of these things. Um, so we have a fair amount of experience and sort of understanding of what goes on in the internals of this. Um, the internal parts of this are mostly standard off-the-shelf off the shelf, uh, open source parts. So just some detail about how Facebook uses open source. We try to track upstream pretty closely. Um, there's been a number of talks about this in the, at some Linux plumbers, some of the kernel conferences and systemd conferences and stuff. Uh, whenever we have a fix or a patch or anything, we try to uh, patch it internally, and then we will push it upstream. Um, and make sure that it will get merged before we actually start using it in production. So what that does for us is it allows us to stay pretty close to the upstream code and we don't end up with a bunch of forks. So all the stuff that I'm going to show you uh, today uh, is built off these components that we use internally. Um, and so uh, all this stuff is available now. Uh, it's all uh, up in open source. You can download it and install it uh, and start playing with it yourself. Another thing about Tupperware is that we've built this for and with um, continuous delivery concepts. So there's a couple talks uh, a few years ago, starting I think in 2017 or so, by some of the people that run um, the website itself. There's a, a RelEng team, I think is, what the, uh, is, uh, is who that was, talking about their continuous delivery system. And essentially about every, uh, back then it was three days, three times a day when we pushed code. Um, so the website itself gets pushed quite frequently. Uh, it's actually a little faster than that now. So whenever um, people make code changes, they get pushed out uh, you know, almost instantaneously. Our infrastructure itself also goes out quite frequently. Uh, we push code every few days uh, out to the entire infrastructure. So all this stuff that I'm going to show you, um, all these components that we're putting together, we're actually pushing code changes and improvements and things pretty continuously. So. Uh, what we figured out is sort of an operational method that allows us to make changes to this large scale system. Uh, and we've learned a few things about sort of um, what the interfaces and APIs and sort of interactions of these components should look like. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the runtime components of the container system. So I work, uh, I'm on the containers team. I work specifically on the runtime and the, um, the lower level uh, constructs. So I work pretty closely with the uh, user space and the kernel stuff. So these are kind of the main five pieces of the system. Uh, Linux, you might have heard of it. It's been around for a little while. Uh, C group two. C group is a control group uh, in, uh, interface for the Linux kernel. It's essentially resource management, uh, memory, CPU, um, network, IO, things like that. Um, C group v2 was written by Facebook, uh, one of the kernel engineers at Facebook. We pushed that forward over, over the last couple of years. Uh, it hit mainstream, I think, in 2017. Um, and now uh, we're using it quite extensively. I'll talk a little bit about why this is better than the old one that Google wrote. Um, BPF. BPF is a, a, an, in, uh, an internal uh, kernel virtual machine. That's essentially a quick way to write kernel level code without having to actually be a kernel engineer. Uh, ButterFS is a file system. Um, it's based sort of on some of the concepts of ZFS. Uh, it's been around for about uh, 10 years or so, I guess. And, uh, and the other one is SystemD. SystemD is a process manager. So I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in each one of these uh, through this talk. So Linux, uh, obviously, <laughs> I like this slide subtitle. I forgot to delete that. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a hardware interface. That's pretty much what it's for, right? Um, it works with storage devices, character serial devices, network stuff, RAM memory, RNGs. Um, it, it's pretty much the thing that controls the physical hardware, right? Um, this is going to be throughout the whole slide of talk. I'm sorry. Uh, it also provides uh, these things called namespaces. Uh, namespace abstractions are essentially like a way to sort of group subcomponents of the same thing so that you can have these like nested hierarchies. 
Uh, there's a couple of namespaces we care about, mostly PID. PIDs are process IDs, so you can have process IDs nested inside process IDs. Um, mount namespaces, where you can have mounts nested inside of mounts, uh, or, or groups of mounts nested inside of groups of other mounts, and then you, one group can't see the other group. Um, User namespaces, these are a little bit newer. We don't, you, um, th these are a little bit more dangerous because the, it's sort of newer stuff in the kernel. We do have some things uh, playing with user namespaces, though. Uh, IPC is a semaphores and various uh, inter-process communication stuff. Uh, secret namespaces for controls, uh, for resource control stuff, and then network namespaces. Um, and network namespaces are things like uh, that you, you hear a lot in the Docker and Kubernetes world about sort of isolating um, network interfaces. We actually have a different approach to this, um, mostly based around BPF. Oops, which way did I go here? Okay, it also provides something that's super important, which is a process abstraction. So Linux is essentially just running workloads. That's what it does. It's all its entire job is just to basically manage what process is running. But there's some interesting abstractions about these processes that we care most about. One is environment variables. This is actually kind of a fundamental concept built into Linux. Um, executables themselves, these are the actual like ELF binaries or various um, types of uh, binaries that are loaded by Linux. Uh, resource management, it's basically responsible for doing mallocs and frees. Um, and for doing uh, slice allocations and things like that for CPU. It's also responsible for handing out file descriptors and making sure those file descriptors are, are set to the right, or given to the right process and handed around properly. Uh, it's responsible for doing I.O. Uh, to and from that process, standard out, standard error. Uh, and then it sort of like manages syscalls that the um, process is making um, in, in order to, to, to do like privilege escalation and things like that. Okay, Cgroup v2. Uh, this is a resource control interface. Um, CPU, memory, I.O. mostly. There is some network stuff. There's actually a, a, a lot of different interfaces here. These are the three that we care most about. Uh, this is a vast improvement over v1. And mostly because of the, uh, the hierarchical interface that it actually uses. And I'm gonna start jumping back over to the machine here. I have a whole bunch of stuff to show you in a terminal. But what I wanna show you about C group, this is kind of an important concept here, is like this is the mount point for the actual C group interface to the kernel. And um, if you start walking down this thing, you sort of get this idea of how it's like built as a nested file system structure. So V1 was not like this, it was like this, like uh, everything was sort of merged into the top controller spec or something. It was super weird to, to inter interact with, and it conceptually was pretty difficult. Plus, there was a lot of things um, related to it that were uh, pretty buggy. Um, adding and removing processes into a C group could be super racy. Uh, so uh, this interface allows us to sort of look at the resource allocation of a machine uh, in a hierarchical fashion. Uh, the, C group, the CPU controller actually works. <laughs> this is um, something that was fixed in C group v2. It actually can do share allocations, so you can do um, uh, workload conserving things, which is essentially like if you have uh, a CPU uh, process that wants to use 80%, uh, but it's not always using 80% of a CPU, it, it will, the C group controller will actually allow other processes to take that um, available space or the available CPU. Um, we mostly think in C groups now. What's interesting about this is that you wrap everything up into a C group and you have processes and mounts and, and BPF programs that can be attached to a C group. And you look at these, um, these workloads being run as a grouping of all of these various resources together. It's no longer just a single process. It's like this control group itself, which can have many, many processes inside of it. So BPF, uh, virtual machine for the kernel. Uh, it's a mechanism for kernel enhancements without having to write modules. Um, it started as a thing called, um, a, well, it was originally e, a BPF Berkeley packet filter, then it became enhanced Berkeley packet filter. Now we just call it Berkeley packet filter again, um, sort of full circle. Uh, it's kind of like mere mortals can write BPF. Um, it, it allows you to sort of work at the kernel level without having to understand all those interfaces and APIs, but also without having to recompile the kernel. Um, you can get tracing of pretty much everything, uh, network, uh, system calls, um, you know, memory allocations. Uh, you, you can actually get a little crazy and start actually like loading the system up on BPF stuff and then you end up running out of 
CPU and memory because you're using it all for BPF in order to trace all the things that are going on inside the kernel. Um, but it also, uh, the import, other important thing is it can be attached to C groups. So you can have one BPF program that does something like, let's say, track all the system calls for a particular C group and you attach it to that C group and now it's tracing just that one, right? So you have a container that's spun up and attached to a C group and you want to see what that container is calling. You can um, attach that BPF program just to that C group. So its primary use is uh, mostly network uh, uh, syscall filtering and monitoring. Uh, network, uh, Facebook has a thing called uh, XDP, Express Data Path, which is essentially an in-kernel, a BPF-based um, mechanism for packet filtering um, that uh, basically can do pretty fast line rate kind of packet, um, uh, packet um, uh, inspection and dropping and things at basically like 100 gigabit rates. So it's, it, it allows you to do very, very fast things because you can do sort of like, um, you can bypass a whole bunch of parts of the kernel. Uh, syscall filtering, so don't let people do things like strace um, or don't let people make system calls uh, inside of containers or inside of particular processes. Uh, and then obviously monitoring. This is one we use quite a bit because uh, we want to sort of know what's going on in the system. Uh, so we, we, um, we use BPF to sort of trace what kind of things are being done. Okay. ButterFS. So ButterFS is a modern copy and write file system. Uh, a copy and write file system is one in which you have a, a set of files and um, it won't actually modify. If you make a snapshot of this thing, it won't modify the original uh, file unless it's changed, right? So once you change the file, then it will actually copy the file and modify the new version of it. Uh, it has compression. Uh, Z standard, which is a Facebook um, compression algorithm, uh, is built into the ButterFS uh, uh, file system now. It's in the kernel, I think, since version 4, kernel version 4.11, I think, or 4.6 maybe. Uh, it provides a concept called subvolumes. So subvolumes are this thing where uh, you can have essentially like full root directories or full trees of directories. It's kind of like a directory, but it's actually like a subvolume. It's a little a little weird. I'll walk through some of this in the demos I'm going to um, go through on my, my terminal. Um, but basically what it, what it allows you to do is sort of like treat subcomponents of the file system as full mount points that can be mounted around, they can be treated as directories, um, they can, you can create snapshots of subvolumes so that you can have some subdirectory snapshotted. Uh, and that also provides the concept for the send receive support. So send and receive is essentially like taking a subvolume and streaming it out to a file that you can then replicate and replay on the other side. Uh, you know, copy that send stream out and then replay it out to um, another machine. This is pretty critical and core to our container system. Um, this is something we've been working on, but making ButterFS better uh, and more stable over the last few years. Um, it's quite good now. <laughs> Not that it wasn't good before, but we fixed a whole lot of bugs in the last couple of years. Um, it also helps that the kernel maintainers for that happen to work for Facebook. So that makes it a little easier. Okay, now we get to the, the, the sort of glue uh, component to this. So systemd uh, is a process manager that controversial uh, over the years. It was started about 2012, I think, or 2011. Um, it's pretty much now the de facto standard. I think there's only like two or three, one, maybe, maybe one now, distro that doesn't use it, maybe two. Um, big ones, anyway, there's I think Alpine and Gen2 and Void, that's another one. Um, three. So what we, with systemd, we kind of like um, think about this as sort of a user space interface for Linux kernel APIs. And what I mean by that is like, uh, in the, over the last you know, 20 years or so, the Linux has been, gotten bigger and people have started using it more. In order to do things like um, you know, set limits on processes or um, attach, uh, you know, C group limitations or, um, you know, do pretty much do anything related to managing processes, you had to sort of use a system call directly, right? So if you wanted to launch a process and then set the amount of memory that it could allocate, you had to launch the process with, you had to write a wrapper that would launch the process, then like take that PID and actually do some manipulation of that PID and make sure that it started properly. And then, uh, make sure that you got all those things done in the right order and it wasn't racy and you didn't end up like, you know, uh, 
ruining the process before it actually got to do its work and or making sure that you got it done before the process actually started doing what it was trying to do. So uh, we use DBus and System, uh, system D uh, to replace essentially spawn and exec v and shelling out commands. So instead of actually like calling bash with a, with a script or with like a command, we can actually talk to system D directly and we can launch a process. And what that allows us to do is it creates sort of a pseudo atomic interface to launching processes with all of these sort of like special properties that you can pass these things. All the namespacing, all the secret management, uh, all the, uh, the BPF stuff, all the, the sub volume snapshotting things like a lot of those things can be done directly through system D and from the um, from this uh, per uh, perception of the caller, it looks like an atomic operation, which is pretty useful when you start building abstractions on top of this thing. Um, it's usable and useful inside the container. Uh, systemd generally is known for running host stuff. Um, that's what, you know, you boot a machine and has systemd in it. Uh, we are now running systemd inside the container because what we find is that it actually provides a significant amount of uh, a benefit to people running workloads in our infrastructure because it's very similar to the host, one, and two, it's a real process manager. And there are lots and lots of reasons why we have to run multiple processes inside of our container infrastructure. Okay, so we get this question a lot, well, why? Why would you do systemd? Why would you do all these things? Why don't you just use Docker uh, or something else? Well, the, one of the big questions that comes up a lot is why do you need a process manager? Right, um, a lot of the existing container infrastructure uh, sort of approaches this problem from the perspective of like one process per container, right? It's like you're just containing this one process. Well, the reality is that um, there are very um, highly coupled workload services or services that run that like need to be co-located. They need to be put together, right? You, you don't wanna have one process that's sort of like processing some machine learning data and then another process that's like processing the output of that machine learning data on two separate machines because you're gonna just basically end up wasting a bunch of resources. You wanna stick those things together. Um, there's lots of reasons for, for this, for caching, for, um, for uh, you know, uh, uh, just efficiency of being able to locate workloads. The other thing is that when you have a lot of services running across a large infrastructure, you have to be able to account for all of the different resources that those services are using, all the way up to like, you know, when they're building budgets and things, right? How much money are we spending to do this particular kind of work? Well, if you don't have good, um, you know, a good understanding of how all these workloads are co-located and sort of what services they belong to, it gets really difficult to be able to roll those numbers up. So uh, what having a process manager inside of a container gives you is sort of more, uh, more accurate uh, accounting of resources because you can actually look at things as a whole, right? You look at them as a C group or you look at them as a group of processes and you can aggregate them a lot clean, more cleanly. Uh, infrastructure services is, is a big one. Um, you know, for logging and security stuff, there's a lots of other uh, cases here, but these are the sort of the big three that we, that, um, that we, we rely on for a process manager. Uh, SSH is a way for users to get into containers uh, without having to get onto the machine. Um, a lot of people run container infrastructure and, and sort of like you use the machine itself as sort of a bastion to get into the container. Uh, in our case, we sort of invert that. We actually don't want people logging into machines. We want them logging into the containers that are theirs in order to debug stuff. That way we can carve up the security aspects a lot, um, a lot better. Okay. So why system D? Why didn't we just write our own or like, you know, you, you know, build something on top of sysv init or something like that? Well, one, it's pretty well tested. Um, it runs in um, most of the major distros. Um, you know, it's, it, the guys work for Red Hat, um, so it, it gets pushed out quite, you know, to a pretty broad, um, broad number of people. Um, operationally, you can transfer knowledge from what you've learned on host management to what you know in containers now. So we have a lot of people that operate servers and we have a lot of people now that can operate containers because they can look inside, they, they, they look in the container like, oh, this looks a lot like system D. So they understand the interfaces, they understand the CLI, they understand the mechanics and behavior of how the system works, they understand how the API works. Um, and so that's a pretty, that's a pretty, pretty big benefit operationally. Uh, there's a, it also gives us sort of a contract for defining what a service looks like. If you look at what a system D unit allows for and the properties that can be set on that, it gives us the ability to 
you know, have users learn that uh, interface, and then they can only do the things that are defined inside of that interface. And so it gives us a very strong contract that's testable, um, and we can validate before we actually start pushing services uh, into production. It gives us orderly startup and shutdown. Uh, this is pretty important for dependency management, obviously, if you want to have something set up before something else. Uh, it, if you've ever tried to build a dependency manager that like make sure that things start properly and then make it generic so that your entire company can use it, it's pretty difficult. Uh, System D has basically solved a bunch of those problems. It's not perfect, but um, you know it works in 99% of the cases. Another interesting thing is this concept that I call late binding config. So System D has this uh, notion of a drop-in, which is essentially the .d directory if you've ever used Linux. Um, what this allows us to do is sort of you can define defaults that get sent with the system that everybody gets unless they override them. And when you override them, you do it with a late binding config. You put it in the .d drop-in directory. And system D is actually the system that takes all of those properties and puts them together so that you, uh, and, and then starts the process with those properties uh, all sort of combined together. What that means is that you can have a bunch of overlay or like overrides and things that are set in the file system so that if an operator logs into the machine or into the container and says, I don't understand why this thing is running this way, they can actually look at the configs that are being used to construct the process without having to like dig through debug logs or build logs or anything else. So there's an operational benefit to the late binding config thing. There's also another concept which I'll talk about in a bit that this applies to. Uh, flexible service composition. Uh, this gives us a way to basically like stick things together um, without having to know what they're going to look like at, up front. Uh, there's an, you know, if you if you have to statically build everything um, and know exactly how things are going to be composed at runtime, it's pretty pretty inflexible. Um, it doesn't give you a lot of option to do things like A/B testing or validation and things like that. And containers are not black and white. Um, this is maybe one of the more controversial statements about sort of how containers work, but they aren't all they. In not all cases do you want all of the namespaces, and in not all cases do you want all of the filtering or the protection that you can get. You don't always want to filter IP address. You don't always want to filter the syscalls. Um, there's lots and lots of variations that can occur inside of this, and systemd gives us the way to sort of pick and choose which things we're actually going to protect against or which things we're going to, we're going to limit. Okay, so let's play with containers. Um, I'm going to run a bunch of stuff here on my command line. Can you guys see this? Everybody okay? All right. I'm going to try and go um, type slow enough so that I can um, not make it too confusing. So the first thing I'm going to talk about here is um, how we actually, what, what it looks like, what a file system looks like for the container itself. So uh, I have this uh, build directory. I have, first thing I'm going to do is this butterfs um, command called subvol list. So this is going to show me all the subvolumes that exist on a butterfs file system. So uh, this server happens to be built with uh, ButterFS as the root volume. But I have two of these subdirectories, subvolumes, right here in build and uh, volumes. I'm going to get rid of the one in volumes because I don't want it. OK, so that's gone. And if I list it again, it's out. OK, so in build root, uh, this looks sort of like a lot like a you know a, a, a root file system for a Linux system, and in fact, um, I run Arch Linux on these demos because uh, I like Arch better, and so uh, this is actually built with Packstrap um, build root base. Oops, ah, something else is running. All right, well, we'll skip this. Oh, I know why. Um, ButterFS. This is what happens when you start running live stuff. Uh, property set build. Build root read only false. OK, so interestingly enough, uh, it was set read only. So let's go ahead and run this again. Cool, yeah, it's going to go and update from the, uh, the upstream package stuff. I'm going to actually stop it because I, don't, I already built this once and I don't want to rebuild it. It takes about 15 minutes or so to rebuild this. And so uh, in order to move on, I want to talk about how what we do with this next. So we have a file system that's 
you know, uh, built with Packstrap. It's basically like you could use the Bootstrap, you could use Yum Bootstrap or Yum Base System, um, whatever your distro of choice is. Well, now that we have this in a subvolume, what I want to do is I want to make sure no one can write to it. So I'm going to mark it as read only. And you'll notice if I look at the mount table uh, for this, well, one, it doesn't show up anywhere because it's not actually mounted as a file system, it's part of the root file system. Um, so you can interact with ButterFS subvolumes just like directories, but the underlying, the underlying structure of it is, uh, allows you to do things like set them read only so you can't write to it. So if I try and you know, touch this, it's gonna tell me it's a read only file system. But I can also do things like snapshot it. So I'm gonna make a snapshot of build root to build stress, because I'm gonna use that later. So now I have a snapshot of build root in build stress. And this is a copy and write file system. So that was like a nearly atomic operation. It actually is atomic from the perspective of the caller. It happens uh, instantly, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It will return an, uh, an error if that snapshot cannot be created. So that's a really important aspect because what we don't have to do in our runtime system is build a bunch of error checking logic around like whether this thing worked or not. If it didn't work, the kernel will tell us it didn't work. Okay, so now that I have this um, snapshot, I wanna do some stuff to it. So I'm gonna use a tool called systemd nspawn. And uh, what this is is basically a, a true mechanism, it's like true on steroids, essentially. Like it does a bunch of namespace management. Um, it has a bunch of properties and, and uh, you can set on the various, uh, on the things that you call, or sorry, the containers that you create with this thing. It's essentially like um, a way to spawn other processes inside of a namespace. Hence the name end spawn. Okay, so build um, stress. And just because I wanna do bash, we'll do that. So now I'm inside, if I look at the, you know, this is my root volume, it's a container, so I don't have an isolated uh, devices, right? Uh, containers don't, uh, Linux doesn't know how to do uh, device namespacing. So inside containers, all the devices that you have are the same as the host's devices. And um, one of the protection mechanisms you can do is essentially make sure that no one can write to those devices through various syscalls and also um, uh, BPF filtering. Okay. So in here, I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna install a little thing called stress ng. I think that's what it's called. Nope, it's just stress. Okay, stress is just a little utility I'm gonna to use to show some things. So now, uh, what's interesting is, well, let me go back to this container and I'm gonna go list all the uh, things. And I have stress installed, but if I, and spawn into the original file system. The one my history is different. I don't have stress installed. Okay. So what 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 can I do with this? Well, the next thing I want to do is I have these two subvolumes, and I want to actually like package them up and send them somewhere. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, first off I'm going to mark the new stress subvolume as read only so that no one can write to it. And then I'm going to send build root through C standard, which is a compression algorithm, and pipe that to dot send stream. CST. So what this is doing is essentially sending, it's the ButterFS send, it's sending the, um, f uh, the root subvolume out to standard out, piping it to Z standard, which is compressing it, and then I'm redirecting it to a file uh, called streams, uh, root send stream.zst. And what this is, is now a file on disk that I can do stuff with, copy it around, put it up on my HTTP server, uh, throw it into your BitTorrent you know, blob distribution mechanism, whatever it is that you have, uh, for as a way to sort of send it out to other machines. Um, the subvolume that I created is now read only. So when I do a thing to reconstitute it, um, I have to do this as sudo. 
I'm going to cat streams root. I'm going to pipe it through Z standard and decompress it. And then I'm going to send it to ButterFS receive. And I'm going to put it in the subdirectory, the subvolume called volumes. Oh, well, I should have put minus V so you could see that it was decompressing. But what I'm doing now on this theoretical other machine is I'm reading this, the send stream, piping it through Z standard to decompress it, and sending it into the um, volume, subvolume. So now if I go look in volumes, there's my subvolume. Um, I could actually inspect it and look at the uh, UUID of this thing, and it would all match up and everything would be the same. If I look under volumes, I only have root, right? Well, I've got this other one called stress that is also um, something I wanted, you know, I need. But I don't want all of it. So I am instead going to just send the difference from the parent root out to a stream. And now I have another send stream, which is just the difference between root and, and stream, or and stress, that's about uh, 63k or so. Is that right? Is that k? Yeah, woo, 64k. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and let's go ahead and receive it to the other side. And all I have to do here is I'm gonna make that V so you guys can see that. So I've copied this out, I put it in my theoretical distribution system. Um, it's gone out to every server. Now I'm gonna run this thing and I'm going to reconstitute it under volume stress. So there's my runtime volumes. So now I've built a, a file system, pulled it out as a send stream, compressed it, sent it around, decompressed it on the other side, put it in place as a subvolume uh, on the deployment server. And now I have a container file system that I can do stuff with. Okay, well, let's do some stuff with it. So let's go ahead and um, run this thing and see what it looks like when we boot up a container inside of uh, with systemd and then actually start playing with it. So I have this little script I wrote that basically just does some, um, uh, what it does is it creates a snapshot of root in a, an instance directory. So I'm creating a read write ephemeral snapshot, or a read write snapshot, it's not ephemeral, uh, of the volume that are of the um, instance that I want. And I just appended some extra stuff to make sure that it was obvious that it was um, you know, a, a unique one. So if I keep running this, I'm just gonna get new instances of this thing, right? Well, that's kind of cool, but what, how do I know it's actually running? Well, one, I could just look for the end spawn command. Well, there's that one, but even cooler, is I can come in here and I can look at the status of systemd, which will print out in a nice little pretty ASCII tree, all the things that are running. And I see that under machine slice, which is a machine C group, a, a control group set up specifically to um, handle all the containers that are running inside that machine. I see two different machines called machine tests with a date and a timestamp and then a bunch of processes inside of it. So, the interesting thing here is you're, I'm on the host machine, but I can look inside the process tree of the container itself. So I don't have to, as an operator, as an infrastructure operator, I don't have to necessarily get into the container to actually see what's going inside of that container. I can just start poking around with it out here. Um, this is a property of the way systemd manages all of its uh, namespaces so that it can keep track of everything that's going on underneath it. So I'm gonna use machine list here to sort of get an idea of what's running. And I'm gonna go ahead and shell into this thing. So what this does is just gives me, it transports me uh, into the container itself called tests and all these numbers. And then inside here, if I look at the process tree, I've got a much less stuff. There's not that much going on. And if I look at system control status, I get sort of a similar view, but it's actually like the smaller section, right, of the larger one that we saw in the outer host. Okay, that's kind of neat. Um, now I can start doing some other stuff. Let me uh, let me run some tests here uh, on this with uh, to make sure that like I want to see if I can stress this thing out and cause something to crash. Let's go 24 meg. Or yeah, 24 meg. And bash. 
Okay, I'm going to start bash. Uh, this is system D run. This is the thing I was talking about where you can tell, this is a command line interface to the dbus, uh, the system D dbus interface that launches processes. So I can use this command to tell system D to launch me a bin bash command and give me a pseudo terminal so that I have a, a shell. But also on it, set the property memory max and only allow it to allocate 24 meg. Ah, oops, I used the wrong, um, I used the wrong root volume because I don't have stress, so I can't actually do that. That's okay. Let's go out here. Let's go su run, uh, bin run, stress test. And we'll take this one off of the stress sub volume. So I'm going to go do this all again and go through the machine control list, stress test. Okay, so this looks the same, not much there, except, ooh, now I have this stress command because I used the other root volume that I built and sent over to the machine. System D run, PTY. All right, so let's go start doing some of this stuff. Oops, like that. Uh oh, well, I keep getting a signal nine. Hmm. Let me go out to the outer machine and see if I can figure out what's going on. Well, that's that's interesting. As I'm running my stress test, I'm being told that the C group ran out of memory and the process was killed um, by the kernel. So inside that subcontainer, I was able to set limits on a bash process that I launched inside the container itself and make sure that nobody inside that container could allocate more than 24 meg of RAM, started a stress test, and now on the outer machine, I can actually see that, you know, through the, through the kernel message that it got killed. Right, so the interesting takeaway here about this is like, we as infrastructure operators don't have to necessarily, um, we, we can give all the power to our cu customers to start building their containers and building the services inside those, um, inside those containers in any way that they want. We don't have to build interfaces around it. We don't have to like wrap um, the way that uh, they define their services to try and give them sort of a new way of defining all the limits that they want. They could just use regular system D properties uh, inside their services that they're writing. Okay, so that's really fun and cool and everything, but like, do they have to build an image every time? Like why, you know, if they have to build an image every time that they're doing this, they have to go through the process of like bootstrapping the file system, they have to go through the process of, you know, distributing all that stuff around, um, pulling out the send stream and sending that. So we have this concept that we've built called, uh, that uses systemd that we call uh, composable services. So composable services are, this concept that like composition is greater than inheritance. So if you think about a layered file system like uh, ButterFS subvolumes or Docker's layering system, it's sort of an inheritance model, right? You inherit from the parent, you make changes to that parent, then you can inherit from that again and you can make changes to that. But if you change the parent, everything below has to be rebuilt, right? You wipe that tree away and you, you have to rebuild everything. So this often causes a lot of problems with cache coherency. You end up blowing out the cache if you have to change the root volume or the root file system. If you have something like an SSL update, um, you have to rebuild the whole world. Everything has to be rebuilt. Um, composable services are not an overlay. It's not a way of like creating an overlay file system and then having a mount point that's like two separate file systems that are sort of merged together. Um, it's not. It's a bind mount where we basically bind mount or copy services into the, fi into the container file system at runtime. So we let system D do all the heavy lifting because we take the service that the customers bundle together and they say, hey, I want to enable this service in my, in my, in my container. Um, I don't have a special image. I don't have anything new. All I want to do is just enable this one thing. And we let system D do the late service binding and spin that thing up without having to actually build the whole thing in as an image. So what it allows people to do is um, it allows service owners to focus on services themselves. So they don't have to worry about what the container infrastructure looks like. They don't have to worry about the stuff that we're having to manage like security and SSH um, or logging or monitoring. 
Uh, they can just focus on their service. They can define system D services that can be unit tested uh, independently of the container. They can test them on their dev, dev server. They can test them in an Arch Linux instance, uh, anywhere that system D is running and they have the binaries they need. Um, it gives us the ability to do flexible and efficient deployments because what we can do is only change, we only have to ship what we've changed. We don't have to rebuild the entire world and send all of the new base images out to everything if we have a change to one of the, compo one of the services. Um, we have a lot of cases of regional customization. So if they're running in one place, you want to run your service one way. If you're running in another place, you want to run your service a different way. Um, that if you think about building images that way, um, you would have to build a, the combinatorial logic of building like each region an image that's special, uh, or building it into your service, your your actual uh, binary itself to like decide where it's at and then make different different logic um, decisions. It gets pretty complicated. It's super hard to debug. Um, it allows for operator overrides. That's us uh, running this infrastructure. We can do things like make sure that you can't use more CPU than you than this than 50% without the service owner having to be involved with that. Um, workload composition, this is a thing where you can take two or three different things, stick them together, and then you can do A-B testing on them and see like, hey, if I run these two services co-located, what does it actually look like? What are the performance differences? Uh, maybe I get a benefit because I'm sharing a cache. Maybe I can use TempFS to transfer data back and forth between two different processes. It just gives you the ability to test these things in a much more flexible way. Um, and the one of the biggest ones is this concept of sidecars. And this is where infrastructure services fall into. This is being able to attach stuff to a service that is running as a container without actually having to change or uh, um, you know, modify the service itself. You can just like plug stuff into the side and do a whole bunch of additional work. So an example of that, let's go ahead and get out of this thing. I'm going to go ahead and uh, compose a service together. Um, I'm going to use the stress. Um, uh, yeah, stress. And then I'm going to call it test. And I'm going to put one together called env. And if I look um, out here, I've got a couple services that I defined, one called env and one called stress. And they just basically do simple things. And they're just simple system D services. Um, that just do one thing. This one runs once and dumps env. Um, the stress one uh, runs stress that I just showed. Oops, I did this wrong. Backwards. I have some, I'm very bad at bash, so don't judge me on that. So uh, this is, a, I started a container now. Um, I set up two composed services, env and stress. Um, this is using the stress volume right here. So I created a snapshot of that. Um, and now I am going to go ahead and jump in. And if I look at the status of that, I have stress running as a service there. And I have had env run. Env was set up as a one shot, so it only runs once and then exits. Stress is running all the time. Um, just to do something interesting here, let's go ahead and set a property on stress.service. Let's make sure it only has 24 meg. Oops. Whoa, uh -oh. now I'm degraded. I have a look at stress service. Oh, it, it got restarted. Restart counters at six. It got restarted a bunch of times. Let's go back on the host and see if I can see what happened. Oh man, yeah, we got killed. So I started the process first, then I told system D to change the property, and then it did exactly what we expected to do, which is run out of memory and die and start getting killed by the OOM killer. So that's a quick example of how I didn't have to change the base image. I didn't have to go through that whole rebuild process of the subvolume. What I did was just basically took two services, two system D services, stuck them in at runtime, and let system D do all the work. Um, so the main takeaways here um, we've got is, uh, this is something I like to quote to people at work. Um, they get super annoyed with me all the time. Uh, but it's not what you build, it's how you build it. Uh, the interesting thing here is as infrastructure providers, we're not really trying to dictate how people put their services together. What we're really trying to do is just build the primitives that are necessary to put the pieces together to allow them to do a bunch of different stuff. Now, that's like the ability or to, the ability to do anything is sounds pretty crazy because um, 
when you have a lot of people doing a lot of different things, you end up with like every possible combination of things that you could imagine go wrong. Um, what, what we try to focus on is providing really low primitives that have very predictable behavior that can be composed and put together in meaningful and understandable ways so that as the system starts scaling, it gets pretty complex when you start looking at it from the big picture, but as you start digging into each of the individual components, they all look, look similar and they all sort of make sense and they're understandable. It's not really about understanding the complexity of the whole system all at once, it's about having a system that is discoverable. And that's what a lot of these lower level components allow us to do. Uh, you can see here that I was able to use system D to build some, you know, show you this super quick demo. This is very, this is almost exactly the way that this stuff works in production. Uh, it's very similar. We just have different tools written in C++ that work much, much faster than my fingers do um, and do it a lot more times uh, in, you know, in one second. Okay. So the summary is like we, you know, we think in C groups, uh, we don't really think about things and processes so much. We think about like, once we start a C group, it's just, that's what it is, it's a C group. Uh, we use BPF for kernel level behaviors, um, ButterFS for file systems. I would encourage you to try it out if you haven't. I think SUSE Linux is, uh, is ButterFS by default now, which is pretty cool. I think it's been that way for a few years. Um, uh, we think of systemd as an interface to the Linux kernel, and it gives us the ability to do dynamic runtime binding. And uh, it's better than exec spawn and bash because we can, uh, we can basically like set properties on processes as they're launched. We don't have race conditions. Uh, it looks like an atomic interface. All of these building blocks are available. Systemd version 241 is released. I think 242 actually just came out. Um, it has a number of patches that we've put in for our infrastructure. Um, we fixed a bunch of bugs. Um, Linux kernel uh, is, I think, up to five now. Um, I think they just did the five meter release. Um, we fixed a few dozen bugs in ButterFS over the last few years. It's a very stable file system. Um, now we've added stuff to C group v2. We've added things like memory pressure that allows you to understand how long it takes for the kernel to allocate memory. Um, I could give a whole talk on what that means. Uh, basically allows us to predict ooms before they happen so that we can save machines from getting killed. Um, all of these things are out there. Like we're not, we're not, you know, the the stuff that it, within Facebook um, that isn't open source is just operational stuff, right? It's like the pieces that we put together, um, or sort of the, the 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 larger sort of orchestration components to like wire these things together. But the, all these little fundamental building blocks are all available to open source, and they're out there for everybody to use. Okay, thank you. So, I think there's some questions. I should go here and then go full screen. How did you get into systems programming? Um, so, I, uh, we can read and contribute. How do you get to the point where you can read and contribute to Linux kernel? Um, I think, honestly, the best answer I have for that is like, um, how did I get into systems programming? I had a really boring childhood and I spent a lot of time in my parents, in my bedroom. Um, <laughs> And uh, I just played with it. I, 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 I just spent a lot of time poking around with it. And then um, I think how to get into it, just, you know, there, there's, there, this stuff is out there. There's a lot of people doing it. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, just trying to find something you can do that um, allows you to sort of play with this stuff. I, I did a bunch of startups before I worked at Facebook. Those were really, really, really helpful experiences for me. Um, so I can only really talk about what worked for me, I guess. Uh, starting at sort of smaller companies and being able to wear a lot of different hats allowed me to dig into sort of the lower level components of stuff and you just have to solve problems because you don't have somebody you can send it to. Um, okay, if you're not using Docker, oh sorry, the other one, how do you get to the point where you read and contribute to the Linux kernel? Honestly, um, just post bugs and like try posting um, diffs and changes. Get on the mailing lists, start reading the conversations. Um, the thing about a lot of these open source projects is like, if you just show up every day and start actually having conversations over time, they'll be a little bit more familiar with you and they'll get to understand you. And then if you understand the code, um, you'll start just, you know, you'll be able to answer questions and then you'll just like sort of integrate in. So just really just get started, just do it and, you know, be present. Um, Okay, if you're not using Docker, what kind of human resources do you use to manage and maintain your containers? Do your developers work on this or do you have dedicated operations? Um, so I guess 
we don't we don't use Docker because well, Docker is essentially the lower level runtime, um, you know, that actually manages all the the um, namespaces and sort of process management stuff. Um, the human resources are there are teams within Facebook that run various different services, and they all sort of work. Um, a, w they work to manage their own service using the tools that we've we've provided to them. So this is one part of much much bigger picture. Um, this sits really low level and sort of builds some of the fundamental interfaces that people can use. But there's a whole big system. Um, there's a whole big system uh, ab around that also to like do stuff that is very Facebook specific. Um, but each team essentially has their own uh, ops and sort of uh, group that manages and runs their containers in our infrastructure. I hope that answered the question. If not, come bug me after. Okay, do you see this as a competitor to other container systems? <laughs> um, oh, I can do that too. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't like to think of it as competitors necessarily, but um, I, I, I do think that the world could use an alternative to what Docker provides. Um, I think that there's a lot more variation to and a lot more complexity to this than the simplicity that Docker sort of started with. The thing that I think that I think Docker got really got right was the Docker file. So the build mechanism is actually the thing that everybody likes. But if you start running the runtime and, and you start scaling that thing out, it gets pretty difficult. Kubernetes is working on sort of solving some of those problems and doing things with their, their pod concept and some of the other stuff that they're working on. Um, there's a lot of similarities to the stuff we're doing to what is going on in the open source and what is going on in the rest of the industry. I think that um, at the end of the day, uh, the thing that we like about NSpawn and SystemD is that um, it is a lot more flexible. And it's, a, it's about building a set of primitives rather than sort of having an opinionated approach to how it must be done. Uh, it lets us do a lot of flexible things that we can't do with uh, something like Docker. Um, okay, show the run and compose script, sure. Also Vim. Uh, this is run. Uh, it, uh, please do not judge my bash. I, this is terrible. Um, I, I'm usually, I do Python and C++, so uh, this isn't usually what I'm doing. Uh, but it's really pretty simple. Um, I just take a timestamp, then I make a sub, uh, sub vault snapshot, um, and then I start nspawn with a particular directory. Um, the interesting thing about nspawn is you can have it make the sub vault snapshot for you and with an ephemeral thing that will basically get cleaned up when nspawn exits. We don't do that because what we want to be able to do is actually keep the read-write volume that's created for the container for debugging or for analysis later on. And that's one part, nice part about um, ButterFS is it actually because you can save that sub-volume of the run of the instance of the container, you could use that for analysis. So if you have uh, you know, systems that you want to make sure nobody writes to certain areas um, and you can't just turn read-only on immediately, you could use this as a way to uh, track and see what people are writing to in, in their file systems and then determine like whether or not you, you know, what you have to clean up in order to do that work. Or you could use it as a honeypot or something like that to like, you know, get people to write stuff that they um, normally wouldn't or normally couldn't. That's run. Uh, what was the other one? Compose. So compose is pretty simple. Um, it's basically just run, but in here I'm looping over services and I'm literally just putting them in place inside of that ephemeral snapshot for the container. So there's really kind of two ways to do this composable service thing. There's this way, which is pre-container. So you set it up and you copy it into the file system. There's another way to do it where you actually start, and start system D inside the container, and then you have system D, you have a special service that you've written that runs early on in system D that does this work for you. So it's really a question of like where you want to do this work. Um, the decision about where to do it is really, uh, in our world, is more about um, resource management. If we do the work to set up the composable service before the container starts, then we are accounted for. Uh, we get the accounting on the bits that are written uh, and the I.O. overhead of that. Uh, if we do it after the container starts, then the customer takes the cost of that. So it's just a question of like how you want the accounting to work. OK. Do you have common approach for intergroups, intergroup communication pipes, DMA, Unix sockets? Um, we do. Uh, it's all of those. We sometimes we pass pipes uh, or we pass sockets between C groups. Um, uh, DMA is another one uh, for some special services. Um, uh, shared memory is pretty common. Uh, Unix sockets is also quite common. So uh, we also don't do um, 
a lot of network namespacing work, and so there's a common interface that services can use to talk to each other on a machine, um, and so that's that's somewhat helpful. What are the main problems with this approach to manage containers at Facebook? Uh, the main problems with this approach are, uh, I would say, um, uh, I would say the biggest problem is that we have uh, we have to change a little bit of how people think about containers. We've gone from the world of mostly single process per container to the world of multiple processes per container, and so what's happening is people are having to sort of figure out. Um, what their service workload looks like differently, or how it behaves differently in this sort of layout and construct. Um, so we can run both simultaneously. We have to do that. Um, operationally, it, this stuff doesn't get shifted overnight. It takes a while to move these things through. Um, so yeah, the biggest challenge, honestly, is just uh, is sort of training and like um, education and getting people to understand how it changes and what it means for them operationally. Is there a chance that Facebook's approach to containers uh, will be released in the future Allograph QL? Uh, yes, I, can, I think I can say that. Um, some of the work that we're doing is already in our incubator, open source incubator. Um, specifically, one that I haven't really talked about much is our build process for containers. Um, we're starting to work on open sourcing that. Um, I didn't talk about it much here because um, it's not really, doesn't really, it's just not ready yet. Um, but the runtime itself and sort of the concepts that I'm talking about, we, are, we would like to be able to open more of this up. Um, the one thing I will say about that is that the tools that I showed, this is an Arch Linux VM that I built to do this demo. Um, this isn't significantly different from how uh, Facebook runs internally. Um, and so th all of these things are available open source wise. You know, it, the, what we would be open sourcing is sort of the orchestration of that, basically our version of the compose and run scripts. Um, that I terribly hacked together for this demo. Okay, any other questions? Is it? Great, thank you. <laughs>